good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. With the first pick, the Detroit Pistons select Cade Cunningham from Oklahoma State University. Chandler again. Oh, what a block by Max Seal! My goodness! The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. There's Jaden playing the passing lane. Sky's a jam. And the crowd loves it. Pistons need a three, and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. He's got it. He's got it. Chauncey Phillips hits the three. Overtime. Amazing. Out of bounds. Detroit Basketball. Welcome to the Palace of Pistons podcast part of the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mike Cangualano. Joining me this week is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, how are you doing, buddy? I I have not been on the show for the last two weeks. I feel like not a whole lot has happened other than a pretty boring... uh, Well, no, I guess I missed the the All-Star game and I missed the trading deadline. So I missed quite a bit. You you missed quite a bit there. And then we had the week off with the All-Star break for, for the Pistons where they only had a couple guys playing in the Rising Stars game. A lot of moves for the Pistons and some news as well from Thursday. I know we're going to talk about all of that, but feeling refreshed as we kick off. I know it's not really the the second half of the season, but it, it kind of also is. I just considered the second half just because it's there's the break uh, from the first you know fifty something games or whatever it is, and I'm refreshed, ready to go for these last thirty something games of the season for the Pistons. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about today, and I'm uh, excited to get into it, as always. We sure do. We have a lot of things to cover, a flurry of moves in the last, I don't know, three hours or so, two hours or so. We're going to get into all of that and more. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor this week's episode, and that is Bet Online. And Bet Online continues to be your number one source for all your basketball major needs, including pro and college hoops throughout the year. We have March Madness coming up awfully soon, uh, so that is exciting in both both exciting and terrifying, but with up-to-the-minute odd stats and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in-game live betting contests and all the best player props, and you can experience the world's best wagering platform anytime, whether from your desktop or your mobile device. Head on over to Bet Online today. Be part of the team, and remember to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, the game starts here. So before we get into the topics of today, um, I'm going to do a, just a quick plug for our Substack. Um, Palace of Pistons has moved from our traditional website over to Substack, um, and the link to our Substack should be available wherever you get your podcasts or if you're watching this or listening to this on YouTube, it will be in the description. Uh, we encourage all of you to subscribe to that. You'll get all of our content directly to your inboxes. And I think the most recent thing that was posted was, other than the podcast, was the trade deadline piece. Is that right, Aaron? Yes. Yes. So if you uh, have been living under a piston-sized rock and you would like a quick summation of what Detroit did at the deadline, and they were the most active team at the deadline, I I encourage uh, you to go over to our Substack, give that a quick look over and uh, subscribe. There'll be a lot more content heading towards the Substack throughout the rest of the year as we wrap up the NBA season, uh, which is fast approaching. Um, But of course, the Pistons continue to make waves even when they're not playing basketball. Um, Our first topic of today is going to be about Isaiah Stewart, who had a bit of an incident a couple of weeks ago. And now, as of today, we have a verdict on his punishment for punching Drew Eubanks, um, getting arrested, (laughs) all the good stuff that you love to see on the team with eight wins um, in the middle of February. But Stewart will be suspended three games. That's per uh, ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. The assault charge that was initially handed down for Stewart was dismissed, so he'll miss the next Three games. He'll miss games against the Indiana Pacers, which is happening in about an hour. Uh, And then uh, a game against the Orlando Magic and the New York Knicks. So another odd turn in what has been a very strange season for Detroit. Um, 
Aaron, you and Jasper talked about it last week of just what a bizarre situation this is, especially for a guy that, you know, the beat has been saying, you know, is one of the leaders of the clubhouse. He's getting guys together. He's, he's, you know, him and Kate are the two that are, you know, keeping everybody on track and whatnot. And then to have this happen, um, in addition to his history of going after LeBron and, you know, that, that became a gigantic meme, you know, what are your thoughts on Stu missing the next three games? And is this going to have any impact on the team other than the fact that you're going to miss out on, you know, some front court depth? Yeah. You know, I don't think it's a, a topic we need to spend too much time on. I know Jasper and I talked about it at length last week, but I think the, the, it, it sums down to this, you know, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes and, you know, it's something that should have never happened but it happened. And, and this is the result. I think, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate that he's out these, these next three games, but there's no way he was going to come out of this, this uh, debacle unscathed. And I think if you're Detroit, you're honestly feeling pretty lucky that it wasn't uh, any sort of longer term suspension. It's really important for the Pistons to figure out how to best utilize Stewart. And they had been kind of going back and forth between using him at, at the five, a little bit off the bench. He was back in the starting lineup before I got hurt and then had this debacle. So I think it's important that he comes back and and the Pistons can use these final 30 games or so to, to really figure out where he fits. I think we, you know, you and I, and a lot of the people that, that listen to the show kind of have this idea of where we think Stewart fits best at. I think, you know, I, you and I are pretty much in lockstep that him coming off the bench as a backup five is, is going to maximize his, his uh, ability to impact the game and for him to be the best version of himself. But the Pistons don't feel that way and they want to keep playing him at the four. So what these final games look like for him, or can he continue to build uh, a pairing with Jalen Duren in the front court? Can the Pistons make it work with Stewart Duren and Fontecchio as the front court? Uh, can they figure out a way to play Stewart with both Duren and Asar Thompson, two other core guys. So it's very important for Stewart to be on the court. This is just another uh, issue keeping him off the court. And when you're already missing games because of injury and whatnot, it's really unfortunate that uh, he has to to sit out these next three simply because of something stupid that, that just should have never taken place. So uh, it's got to be a learning lesson and he's got to come back for hopefully to figure out where he's going to fit with this team moving forward. If he's going to fit with this team moving forward. Yeah, but that's pretty much the only thing you, you could take out of this is it's, boneheaded decision it was a boneheaded thing then it, and it is um, going to have some negative repercussions with him missing games no matter how you feel about Isaiah Stewart and his fit um, we've been pretty vocal about starting him as detrimental to the offense especially uh, especially now with even less shooting on the roster around him but yeah it, it's it's a brief time for the Pistons to evaluate life without Isaiah Stewart in the rotation at all. Um, I don't think it has too big of an impact um, because ultimately you should just sign him to an extension. He is going to have a tradable contract this upcoming off season. So I don't think the Pistons are thinking about that right now. I think what's more concerning is that he was heralded as a guy, him and Kate Cunningham during the massive losing streak as keeping guys motivated, keep the guys on task, you know, being a vet in the locker room. And to have something like that happen, they are lucky that it wasn't a you know a Draymond Green esque. I know that he had some more um, prior offenses that led to that big suspension, but they're lucky that it wasn't something more significant uh, because it it really could have. Um, so disappointing to see from a morality standpoint, but ultimately you know, he's going to miss some games. Um, the Pistons will get a a look at life without him, but. I don't know how much of an impact this is going to have um, in terms of his staying power on the, on the roster beyond this year, either. It's it's just going to be a brief blip out of the all-star break, which has already been a weird, weird time with, you know, guys being out after playing in the all-star game. Like Donovan Mitchell is now out today. LeBron is out. And so weird. We, we had this happen. Yeah. It's very, it's very bizarre, but whatever. Um, so for Stu, it's more. I'm more disappointed from a from a morality and ethics standpoint. Um, but I agree, we don't need to spend any more time on this. You know, it is what it is. They'll be playing without him, and you know, that, for the best. Oh Lord, never mind. 
not a stomach ache. <laughs> it's got that's, um, that's got a few people pumped. I'm telling you, there's a very small group of people that are that saw the Stewart suspension come down and praise the Lord above because they knew that solidified 15, 20 minutes for James Wiseman these next three games. There are some people that were elated about the Isaiah Stewart suspension. I wonder if one of them was Bob Myers. <laughs> trying to find a reclamation um, project. Um, yeah, that is going to mean more James Wiseman, and that means less happy for us. But there are people that are hell-bent on thinking that he has untapped potential to be a superstar. He just hasn't been given that chance, even though he's what he has. I don't want to turn this into a James Wiseman roast, because we could do that every single week. Um, let's talk about some of the other moves that the Pistons made. Um a lot of G League moves, and I wish we had Czar on to help us sift through all of them and, and give his context. Um, they waived Malcolm Castle. I don't that was a few days ago, maybe even yesterday. Not a not a super big move to me. I mean, I, I've not been keeping up with the Motor City crews too too much. Um, but they converted Stanley Mune to a standard deal. I think that is a bigger deal uh, in terms of impact with the Pistons. Stanley have really earned an opportunity i think um so that's nice to see they signed buddy Beheim, and of course jasper's not here to wave his syracuse orange flag <laughs> from buddy getting another right chance for a second can <laughs> we stop right there for a second i don't yeah. think i've seen jasper more excited about anything to happen to the pistons in the past three years the two two three years that he's been a part of palace of pistons than he was when they signed Buddy Beheim. I mean, the victory lap this guy was taking on X and in our group chat, hilarious. I mean, look, I'm glad Jasper's happy, but Jasper's got enough going for him. He didn't need this. The same way the Pistons really didn't need this. And look, I'm not going to get all up in arms over a, a two-way contract deal. I get Buddy Beheim has been a little bit better this year, and like I recognize that that's good for him. But come on, he played ten games with the Pistons last year. His true shooting percentage was under twenty nine percent. Ninety three percent of his shots were from the three point line, and you know what he shot from the three point line in his ten games with the Pistons last year? Sixteen percent. It's just. Look, I'm glad he's gotten better, but look, he's 24 years old. There's no reason for the Pistons to really be going out and making it a, a key move to go and sign Buddy Beheim to a two-way contract, who, by the way, was already a part of your program. He was already playing with the Motor City Crews. This is one of those moves that has Mike Villani on 97 won the ticket, talking about how the Pistons are, are doing favors for friends and whatnot, and it's just I, I, people were were losing their mind over this two way contract. And at the end of the day, is it that big of a deal? No. Does it really impact anything that the Pistons are doing? No. But it's just it's just hilarious because it's like you don't even you don't even use it on a guy that that maybe is young, went undrafted, whatever. I don't know. Buddy's twenty four. The numbers got a little bit better last or this year, but we saw him play in the NBA. Uh, last season and it was very clear that he was nowhere near close to being an NBA player and for a team that just got rid of what three four non-NBA players at the deadline who by the way have not been able to find new teams in the NBA I just don't understand what the point is of signing a guy to a multi-year contract that I don't know unless he comes up in this these last 30 games and gets a few opportunities and shows he's a completely completely different player you're just going to be looking at this contract as like a just another blip in the in the Troy Weaver masterpiece. I mean, there's like a 99% chance that it is just a blip in the Troy Weaver masterpiece, which has all sorts of paint of various colors. There's some feathers. There's like macaroni art on it. It's a whole thing. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a nothing burger. I mean, I, all four of these moves that I put down, I, I don't know how to pronounce the other individual's name. Tosan, Aaron, do you want to give it a go? Oh, I remember it too because they they I've heard it a few times. 
I, I'm not going to say it out of respect because I can't remember it. I actually do like the idea of bringing him in under contract because he's actually had some really productive minutes in the G League this year. He was playing very well with the Motor City Crews at the beginning, beginning of the season. He's a rookie coming from Princeton, went to the Memphis Grizzlies for a little bit on a yep. 10-day contract, then was with Detroit right before the break on a 10-day contract. So he's had some good minutes in the G League. Uh, I think it kind of makes sense for, for Detroit because right now, without Isaiah Stewart especially, they're a little thin up front. Again, I don't really know how much he's going to play with Detroit the rest of the year. Maybe you don't really see either of these guys until it's the last 10, 15, 20 games and Maybe the Pistons have kind of are kind of pseudo shutting some guys down for the rest of the season, but uh, Tosan actually has uh, some NBA level skills that I'm interested in seeing him at least get a few more minutes uh, with Detroit this year. I think there's there's uh, you know some benefit to that, and and also for the Cruz's sake, the Motor City Cruz have been a pretty good basketball team this year. But something that you need in the G League that's hard to come by are bigs and. Tosan's a guy that now on a two-way contract is going to be able to play a lot of games with them and probably help them this year a lot. So I like it for the Cruz, I think, more than I like it for Detroit. But getting him back and kind of keeping him guarded from any other team, I I like that a lot more than bringing uh, bringing Buddy Beheim onto a a longer-term contract. Um, to be clear, this is not a Syracuse hoodie that I'm wearing. This is an old Cavs hoodie. Just, just so that everyone's clear that I'm Gaster not would be pining. head to toe in Syracuse gear if, if he was on the podcast today. Had, I, I can't fa- facial detail. I, He'd have it all on <laughs> face paint. Um, for what it's worth, it is Tosan at Woma. That's right. That's right. That is the correct pronunciation, and he was called Ivy League Giannis. Um, just so that we're all aware. <laughs> uh, and he, he's British. Very interesting. You don't see a whole lot of British players making it in the NBA. But, yeah, he was like a point forward for Princeton during the NCAA tournament, I believe. So the he's versatile. We had a few guys get NBA looks this year. I mean, they lost – the Motor City Crews lost John Tate Porter early into the season, which – Elevated Tosa yeah. into a bigger role with Motor City. They they've had a couple good players down there, uh, you know, get called up into the NBA this season. So again, I you know I like Tosa. It would actually be really nice to have Jonte Porter right now because I think I'd rather see Jonte yeah, Porter Jonte Porter minutes uh, over James Wiseman. But oh, by far. Just thought I'd bring that up. There have been a few guys. I mean, Tosan's only twenty two. You know, I I think he's worth a look. I again I like, like it a little. Not that it matters. These are two-way contracts. Like in the grand scheme of things, this means nothing. Yeah. The conversation is is very niche. I'm sure a lot of people don't know who these players are, know that these moves happen, or cared that they happen. But I don't know. I'm at least a little bit intrigued by well. Them. Well, I think the one out of these four, I think converting Stanley Muni's contract to a standard deal probably has the biggest impact on the Pistons. And even that's not a huge impact, but Stanley deserved at least an opportunity with the shooting that they sent out at the deadline and Bogdanovich and Burks. Um, they got rid of Joe Harris and whether you want to say he's a shooter or not, technically he was considered one of the rare shooters on the roster. So you got to fill that in some way. What do you think about Stanley Muda getting a, getting a standard contract and then having some time to, you know, get some minutes on a Pistons team that needs shooting I mean, I don't know, how, you know, what you could really expect out of him, but you know, this is probably the most impactful of the moves that they made. Stanley Amude's earned that roster spot for the rest of the season with, with the Pistons. He's had some big performances up with the main ball club this year. Like, is this a guy that's going to go out and turn into this, you know, guy that's worth a three, four year, fifteen million dollar year contract? Like, no, probably not. But the way that he competes, the shots that he's able to make, like. There are NBA skills that he has, and Detroit wasn't going to bring in, you know, some guy off the waiver wire, some veteran that's played five, six, seven years in the NBA at this point in the season with being an eight-win ball club. This is the type of move that that you make. Amude on a two-way contract has given you some good games, shown he can be an NBA player. Bring him up for the rest of the season. 
there will be opportunities to get him minutes. In fact, you could argue that you should prioritize minutes for him over some of these guys that were playing before the deadline, a.k.a. Evan Fournier, and see what he can develop into. You've got him the rest of this year. You can see what type of progress he makes next offseason and then bring him into camp and let him compete for a roster spot and see how much better of a player he's become at a much younger age and a very cost-controlled contract for next season. So that is definitely the most impactful move that the Pistons made on Thursday, and it's by far the, the best one as well. Yeah, I, I would agree. He definitely earned that spot. Um, 5.2 points. He's shooting 54% from three, which very small sample size, obviously, but it at least demonstrates that he can shoot. Um, and really, what do the Pistons have to lose? You know, they don't have – they don't have any shooting before the deadline. They have even less of it now, even though Simone Fontecchio is, is a shooter and, you know, seems like, like he's a good fit. Still, you need to find some shooting somewhere, and he's low risk, you know, low-ish reward. But, you know, you give a guy a look, and you never know. Stranger things have happened. There, You know, Craig Porter Jr. for the Cavs has been a viable – player for them he's been their best backup point guard by a country mile and he was, was on a two-way before he was recently converted you know there's plenty of g league john tay porter is getting minutes right now for the toronto raptors he's getting pretty regular minutes behind yaka Pertle. i mean there are good players to be found in, in the g league and i think one of the reasons that you know the nba changed the name or wanted to change the name from the developmental league is that it was known as like a badge of misfortune or failure and that's really not what it is it is a different league to set players up to be more successful in the NBA. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing more minutes from Stanley. We've got a bunch of young guys on the roster already. You just add one more and you know see what he can do in some limited minutes. Um, speaking of the rest of the season, let's talk about what we're going to be looking for for the rest of the season. What players you're going to be looking for? Are you going to be looking at Monty Williams as coaching? You know, who has the most to gain, who has the most to lose? So let's just start with the, you know, softball question of what you're looking for the rest of the season, Aaron. You know, is it something in particular? Is it a player? Is it a rotation? Is it, uh, you know, a, a particular skill set from somebody? There's there's a lot of things to look for with this group. There, there just has to be a lot of different improvements across the board. You know, you could talk about a multitude of storylines and narratives with this team. Can Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivey continue to to form a, a an encore partnership and coexist in a way that's going to benefit the Detroit Pistons, right? What type of improvements can Jalen Duran make? I think the biggest thing for me, people talk about his need to be able to shoot the ball, expand his range, even hit the mid-range shots. And yeah, you know, I, I certainly agree. Like those are things that he should be striving to get better at and, and add to his game. But the fact of the matter is it's very, very important that he starts to learn how to compete on the defensive end and, and make winning plays for 48 minutes on the defensive end without fouling and having to exit the game in foul trouble. Like, can he become a better communicator? Can he become a better rim protector? Can he play better post defense when he's getting posted up by these bigger bigs, the Nemanja Sabonis, Jonas Valenciunas? Like, can he do a better job of using his size and athleticism in those matchups, learning how to play against these more seasoned post players and, and help lead this defense. Like he's going to be a part of their identity, especially on the defensive end long term, you'd have to imagine, if he's a fit with this group. So I, I think looking at Jalen Dern is super, super uh, important. And what can the new guys bring? This is really a tryout for them, right? Simone Fontacchio, Quentin Grimes, both those guys expected to be back with the Pistons next year. You're going to expect to see ample opportunity for them and seeing where they fit who they play best with. Is Funtecchio a long-term answer at, at, at a starting forward spot? Is it Quentin Grimes? Do Grimes and, and Marcus Sasser make for this, you know, super dynamic bench scoring unit together? I think those are just, you know, just a few of the, the questions on the court. What happens, though, with someone like Monty Williams, who has been largely criticized all year long? Does he get away from, I think, one of the, the biggest things with him that, that has stood out with me, he'll say something, whether it be at a practice or a pregame shoot around or a postgame press conference, and then they'll get to that, that next game and he'll contradict what he said and do the opposite. 
So can he find a way? You know, I think one of the things he's mentioned uh, post All-Star break is that he wants this team to, to really compete and be competitive these final 30-something games of the season. That was probably his big quote from, from his post-deadline, or excuse me, post-All-Star uh, break press conference. And it's like, okay, well then are they going to be or are you going to continue to play 12, 13 guys a night like it's CYO basketball and you've got to play everyone a certain number of minutes and you've got to cap guys a certain number of minutes. So, you know, is he doing what he says he wants to actually do? Is he actually going to follow up and, and do that in his role as the head coach? So there's a lot of different things to look for. Didn't even touch on Asar Thompson. Didn't even touch on, you know, has the game slowed down for him now? Can he find ways to be more effective on offense so that he can be on the court for longer stretches and, and in closing minutes of a game? Uh, I think Cade Cunningham in general, like these last 30 games for him, he's extension eligible this summer for that rookie max contract. That's a big deal and a, a big storyline that I don't think is getting looked at enough. Like if he comes out and it's kind of mundane and just kind of average or gets hurt again, are you comfortable locking him into a five-year max contract this summer? Do you want to do that? So I know that was a rant. I know that was a lot of different things. You know, if there's anyone that you want to go over specifically, we absolutely can. But there's a lot in my going on in my mind about this these post All-Star break Pistons. I think there's a lot of different storylines to watch. Those are the biggest ones for me. Um, th those are all very important. And I think Duran being you know, just growing up, I think, is a sneaky one. Because as the roster gets closer to extension eligible, Cunningham will be able to be extension eligible, eligible this summer. Ivy's not far behind. Um, that means neither is Duran. You're going to have to look at the long-term feasibility of this roster when you're handing out extensions to everybody. And if there's a player that isn't, doesn't look like they're going to be the right fit, you know, they are going to be eligible to be moved. And we already saw inklings of that this you know, deadline period of, oh, maybe they can move Ivy um, because there's some redundancies or, are you know, what they move on from Durham because his defense is really his defensive IQ is just not quite there yet, but he's, you know, super young. Um, so I totally get that with Durham. And I think that's worth monitoring because eventually the Pistons are going to have to figure out who they're going to keep and who they're going to build around. And, you know, when you want to go get a superstar to glue everybody together, you know, who, who is on the chopping block to make that happen or who are you willing to move on from? Um, I'm looking at the wings. I'm looking at Grimes and Thompson. I think they're kind of Spider-Man memeing, uh, you know, each other a little bit as high intensity defensive guys that other teams really want. Um, but who are kind of hampered a little bit by the shot. Grimes is a little bit better lately shooting. You know, he fits a lot better. He's, he, he's a you know slightly more advanced version of Asar right now, but Asar probably has more athletic ability and maybe has a higher ceiling. Definitely has a higher ceiling, but I'm watching the wings because those are two guys that you want to have in your rotation regularly next year. The shot for Asar Thompson is going to be going to continue to be the thing that holds him back the most. If he can develop a corner three, gain some confidence, you know, have a little bit of a wrinkle in his game, I think that pushes a lot of momentum into next year, and that's exciting, or, or next season, rather. Um, interesting point, though, about Cade being extension eligible. Are, you know, would the Pistons do that? And I think they're definitely going to do that. I think they have to do that. The question is, with all the moves that Monty has made and not made, or rather Troy Weaver has made and not made, no rookie has not accepted the rookie scale extension before. No one has, because it's so much money, everybody takes it. It's one of the CBA's, you know, tricks in keeping players from just moving teams year after year after year after year. Ben Simmons took it, um, you know, Brandon Ingram took it, Zion, all of these guys took it without even hesitation because it's so much money. Not that this is going to happen, but, you know, would Cade be the first guy to do, the, you know, to do that and say, never mind, you know, I'll I'll take my chances elsewhere. Or if the Pistons don't offer him the full mask, Max for some reason, you know, is, is that going to be a whole new storyline of, you know, they didn't offer the Max, he didn't accept it. Now we're, you know, looking at trades for Cade Cunningham. And I, I just have bad, bad feelings of, 
you know, is he going to be the first one to reject the rookie scale extension and all that money? You know, he'll take less money to go somewhere else just because the Pistons have built the team in such a strange way that has made life more difficult for him. See, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more so on the, the side of like, has Cade earned that extension this off season? I think there's, there's more work to be done on his side rather than him rejecting it. Like, should the Pistons offer it to him? I mean, I don't know. Maybe he just left a really bad taste in my mouth from the final two games before the break. But I just think there are some He's clear good. of improvement for him. And I, I think I'd be a little concerned if we're going into the off season and we're kind of having these, these same discussions and we're seeing these same types of things where it's the last the days of moments throughout the games. It's the games where he finishes with, you know, 12 points on four of 12 shooting and six turnovers, like that kind of stuff for a number one guy for a, a, a max player. It's just not acceptable. You, you can't, you can't lock yourself into that. And, you know, it, it doesn't mean if the Pistons don't offer him that extension this, this summer that he's gone, like he'd still be under contract for the following season. He would still be a restricted free agent for the following season. So you could still sign him to, that max contract that summer, but I think there's just more for him to prove on that end. And I, I think outside of Detroit, people feel that way. Maybe the people in, in, in Detroit don't necessarily feel that way. I know there are a lot of people that are, are in lockstep that Kate's the guy. And I, I do, you know, gun to my head, I do think Kate's the guy, but I need to see another step to his game in these final this final part of the season for me to feel comfortable giving him that that rookie max this offseason and that's fair and you're right it doesn't have to be this offseason they will have time to do another contract offer the following offseason um and you know hopefully the pistons put a better roster around him this offseason so that they're able to accurately um assess whether he is the guy because i think you're right i think there is a, a, a probably a healthy amount of people that are not sure if he is but to those people i i say well i don't necessarily think he's been given a fair shot to be put in a position to succeed and you know there is some blame for Cade, and something's out of his control like injuries and you know We'll have to see what this offseason brings. Not that that's something to watch for the rest of the season necessarily, but K playing well is is definitely going to be up there, um, especially now that the roster is you know set for the rest of the year. Um, well, you got well, your guys, yeah. right? Right, exactly. Um, I I gave the the deadline a six out of ten for Detroit because I thought they made some moves they kind of needed to, um, but you know. I think the big win was not doing something big and stupid. Um, so what about who has the most to gain and who has the most to lose for the rest of the season? Um, certainly all the G League guys are going to need to make their moment matter whenever they're on the court. But aside from the G League guys, you know, who has the most to gain and who has the most to lose for the last, you know, couple of weeks here of the season? I mean, if you had to say financially, I think it would be Cade, just in, in, in light of the conversation that, that we just had. Sure. You know, outside of him, with all of the discussions surrounding Jade and Ivy this season, how the beginning of the season went, him coming off the bench, him being challenged by Monty Williams, having to really fight for rotation minutes, playing behind Killian Hayes to kind of being forced into being the guy with Kate Cunningham out, getting that opportunity to play in the starting lineup and absolutely crushing it with Kate out. And the numbers have still been good with Kate back. It's just, uh, can, can him and, and Kate do enough these last 30 games to prove that they're worth building around moving forward. I think Jaden Ivy is a guy that, you know, if things don't get better over these last 30 games, look, he's been in, talked about as a guy that, that could be moved before teams obviously know he's talented but if his best minutes are are only when Kate is off the court does he get moved and you know I think him and, and Kate Cunningham do do work together I think the numbers say that and I think what we've watched 
says that at times as well. But if, if the Pistons don't end up winning more than you know two three games the rest of the of the year, I think they have to look at some of these these core guys on the roster and say, look, I don't think we can continue to go with this iteration of the core if these are the results we're getting. And, and maybe we need to to package Ivy with a pick or Ivy with with something else and go get uh, a a six eight six nine wing that that's going to help this team and and maybe doesn't need the ball in his hands as much. So. I don't know. I, I think Ivy would be my guy if I couldn't pick Kate. I just think financially speaking, Kate is is my answer. But I think Ivy is too. I don't know if there's really anyone else that that is at that same magnitude because I don't think we're really concerned about the likes of someone like Evan Forney, right? He doesn't really have a lot to gain or lose here. I, I don't really think it matters. He's an expiring contract right now. The Pistons are waiting to get him off the books. And I, I just don't think there's anyone else that that matters as much as Ivy right now that you're probably seriously worried about uh, being able to to work with this core and with this this team long term. I don't think you're you have that mindset for Asar Thompson yet after just one season. And, you know, I don't think uh, Jalen Duran is in that spot yet unless he has a, a really rough last 30 games. So you mentioned two or three games left that the Pistons win. How how many games do you think they're going to win the rest of the way? They're at eight wins right now. So so I, looked, I have the schedule up if you'd like to see it. I, I did look at the schedule, and I kind of okay. went through and looked at the opponents and said there's probably ten games that they can compete in or at least should compete in against teams that aren't in the playoffs or are maybe on the verge of the play And So I looked at, like, Brooklyn – Memphis, they've got a game against Washington still. They end the season at uh, against San Antonio. Uh, they've got a couple games against the Bulls. So I got to like 10 games that they should compete in and, and have a chance to win in. Like, do they win five or six more games this year? Is that is that fair? Do they end with 14, 15 wins? Does that seem right? I mean, I think it's possible. Five wins would probably be what I would say, I'd say five, they win five more this year. Um, maybe they find a way to, to steal a game against someone like Indiana. I don't know, but I, I, I think I'd say five would is what I would expect as high, you know, maybe seven or eight, which is really sad to say, but it could also win as few as two or three. I mean, yeah, this team, this team didn't give us a lot to work with heading into the all-star break, but Hopefully a uh, so, practice or two uh, more now that they're back and getting someone like Quentin Grimes back as well. They'll bring back Isaiah Stewart in a handful of games here too. So you think they'll be a little bit better over, over the last 30. Well, they should be a little bit better because they got a little bit better at the deadline. You know, they play Boston twice and they play the heat back to back. I think I just went through, I counted, I, I think I counted the exact same 10 games that you did. <laughs> um, I think five would be fine. Five would be great. Um, between five and seven. And, you know, I'm looking at the tail end of the schedule. There's no teams that are going to be resting guys because they clinch playoff spots. Like if they played Boston or Miami towards the end, maybe not the Heat. But definitely Boston. If they had played Boston later in the season, you know they may have been able to sneak a win against the Celtics, who just rested everybody and played Pey- and played a uh, Peyton Pritchard for forty minutes. But I don't think that's going to happen. It's they they play the Celtics the twenty second and the eighteenth. They're not going to be clinching by then. Yeah, I would be fine with five wins because um, you're integrating a lot of new players too, and you know there will be a bit of a curve there, and they're already not very good, so. Five wins will be what I say. They could sneak one against the Bulls. The Nets look totally hapless. Um, the Grizzlies might have Killian Hayes by the April 5th meetup. Oh, no, so he's not on a he team that, man. That dream might be over. No, he's not. I mean, we were talking about – Yeah, that was a flash. Not get a second-round pick for Killian Hayes. He's going to get picked up by someone, and you'd think a team would have done it by now, and they haven't. So, like, the reality is the Pistons just had three or four non-NBA players on their roster, some of them starting and playing 30 minutes a game for them. And I think we're just going to have to live yeah. with the reality for this team for the first 50-something games. 
short term memory. You just have to move on. <laughs> just have to forget that that happened and look towards the future. So um, the last thing was, because I thought that this was great. Monty Williams uh, had some comments on the 20th, uh, this would be yesterday, about how the team is going to be playing to win down the stretch. I'm not going to be throwing certain combinations on the floor just, just to see how they look. We're done with that. We'll be competing. Naturally, this was uh, quote tweeted to hell on X. And it's just another in the long line of Monty Williams-isms of where he doesn't have to think about Isaiah Livers playing. He, he just knew. He didn't have to think about it. He knew he was going to start him. Just the comments that he's made have been nothing short of like – Backed in levels of foolishness, but any thoughts on Monty now fully pulling the lever on the win now mode for the Pistons? Look, man, let's see it before we, we, we think it's over at this point. It goes back to what I've said earlier. Monty said a lot of times certain things that he needs to do or is going to do or wants to do and then doesn't do it. So, you know, I'll be watching this Indiana game. Obviously, we're recording before it here on Thursday night. I'll be watching the game against Indiana. I'll be watching the games after that. And we'll see if that actually happens. You know, we'll see if he's playing nine, ten guys, bigger minutes, heavier minutes, what he's doing with Isaiah Stewart when he's back. I'll believe it when I see it with him. The last thing I'll say is, you know, you mentioned the tweet getting uh, quote, quote tweeted to hell. And it's been Monty Williams' season. I've never seen... It wasn't this bad with when Stan Van Gundy when the, was the Pistons coach. It wasn't this bad when DeWitt no way. was the Pistons co- coach. I've never seen more tweets get picked up by Pistons Twitter as as quotes from Monty Williams, and they just go off on the quotes. It's it's unlike any other coach before that in Detroit. It's happened to a few of the quotes I've tweeted out this year from from press conferences that I've been at. Obviously, we've seen it on a ton of you know, James Edwards or or Amari's tweets. So I've just never seen that before. And Monty Williams is certainly aware of it too, because he's, he's made a comment a few times where it's like, I I can't say this or or, I got to be careful what I say because Twitter will have a day with it or something along those lines. So he's aware of it. And I'm always just picturing him in his press conferences. Like I've really got to be careful what I say here, or this is going to get be all over Twitter for the next two and a half hours. There is a way to fix that, and it's to not say such random crap like this. Like, what, what does it even mean to be like, oh, we're going to compete now? Right. What was he missing before? You know, right. You, you've won eight games. You've said before you wanted to play 82 competitive games this year. You haven't done nearly half of that. What do you mean now it's about being competitive? I, it just doesn't really make sense. So, I, I look, at it's, it's like – I feel bad for the guy, but at the same time, he brings this upon himself with some of the things that he says and does. So I, I get why Pistons, yeah. who is frustrated beyond frustrated, you know, does what they do. Yeah, the stuff that he does and says just goes viral. Like when he, I don't remember what game it was, but he was walking through the tunnel at the end of the game and he just like ran his hands over his head while he was walking back and, every, you know, it, it got – on to NBA central or whatever, any of those, you know, aggregator accounts. And it has like 1500 quote tweets of like, this man's going through it. Yeah. He is going through it as, as are all of us watching the Pistons every single game. We're also all going through it. I'll just say this. If James Wiseman plays more than like 10 minutes, even with Isaiah Stewart out, we know that, you know, he's just full of it, full of it in this be competitive landscape. Um, Mike Pascal is beginning every single Back up a minute, just because he can do one thing well, and that's shoot. Even if he goes 05, at least he can stretch the floor. So I'm very interested to see uh, how, what levers Monty pulls now, now that he's in full win now mode. So, Aaron, we've, we've got through all of our topics. Do you have anything else as, uh, you know, the Pistons are about to play in what, 30 minutes? Yeah, they're are they at five. seven or 730. They play at seven, so about 20 minutes from where we're this up. So, Okay. Do you I have think, any other thoughts before we wrap up? I think we've covered covered it all. Uh, I think we need to see what this team looks like post All Star break to to really start to be able to make some some take make some bigger analysis on on where they're going moving forward in in, in the players on the court. So 
like I said, I'll be watching these next handful of games very, very closely to see if this is a different team uh, than the team that they were heading into the All-Star break because those final two games were, were, were just such bad examples of how to play basketball that it, it was – it was just so frustrating to watch. So yeah. looking for a better, a better performance from this team as they try to salvage whatever's left of the season. Yeah. I, I'm very interested to see how they look. You know, this is still a team with lots of good young players on it. A coach that was coach of the year, despite not acting like that at all. Um, it's still a team that has, I don't want to say a high ceiling, but at least an intriguing one. There's there's a lot of talent on this roster. Um, I'm interested to see how it looks with maybe some more players that fit what they need in wing defenders like Grimes and big shooters like Fontecchio. So I'm very – I'm looking forward to seeing how they uh, play the rest of the way. You know, you talk about most to gain and most – most to lose, you know, that includes the coaching staff in the front office too, to me. Um, Maybe Troy Weaver's, you know, going to be playing with, you know, just whatever because he's on his way out. But I don't think that that's, I don't have, we haven't been given any indication that's what it is. He just signed an extension. So um, I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how how the team plays the last portion of the season here. I think it's going to be telling to what kind of off season we're going to be heading towards. And, and before we go, I do want to take some time to do some end of show plugging, shouting out all that good stuff. Again, the Substack stack need your support over there. Need you guys subscribing to our Substack. It helps us out a lot as we kind of go into this new iteration of the palace of Pistons brand. Uh, we really, really need you to subscribe. So the link to do that is in the, the the description of the wherever you're listening or watching this on or from. It's also as easy as going to palaceofpistons.com and typing in your email to subscribe to, to our newsletter. Obviously, wherever you're listening from, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, leave us a like, drop us a follow, leave us a rating, all that good stuff. Love hearing what you guys have to say uh, in the YouTube comments as well. You guys are always very active in there, so we appreciate that a ton. Make sure to follow us on our socials as well. Follow us on Twitter at Palace of Pistons. We're also on TikTok now, Palace Pistons on TikTok. So make sure to give us a follow there as we grow that page uh, as well. We're on Facebook, Instagram, all the big places. Make sure to drop us a follow there. Show your support. We really, really appreciate it as we go into uh, the, the final games of the season. Yes, dutiful leader Aaron doing doing the business. Um, yeah, you know we started doing this just as you know friends who wanted to talk about basketball. Now it's turned into something bigger with people who care the same way that we do and follow and you know care enough to comment. And you know we we love that. So we want to make sure that we reach as many people as possible and um, don't leave anybody behind. So we do appreciate all of the support. We hope that there'll be more of it. Uh, even though the season's been kind of a huge uh, <laughs> bomb, but, you know, still plenty to talk about. And we hope that you'll be joining us. So before we go, I would like to thank the sponsor of this week's episode, and that's Bet Online. And you can use our promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit when you use Bet Online. For my co-host, Aaron Johnson, I'm Mike Anguilano. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, and we will see you all next time. Bye.